Chapter 5, Me and the Devil. Early this morning, you knocked upon my door, and I said, Hello, Satan. I believe it's time to go. Robert Johnson. When I awoke, Sam was asleep in the curl of my chest. A strand of her hair stretched across into her mouth. We had gotten to sleep only towards dawn. My arm was draped across her hip, brown and hairy as a coconut. Her own skin was white and lightly freckled, covered in almost invisible swirls of hair. For a long time I lay there, watching her as she slept. You lucky son of a bitch, I said to myself. Don't fuck this up, Jack. You'll never find another one like her again. I bent my face to hers, kissing her on the cheek. Nobody had ever been that beautiful ever, anywhere on earth. I drifted a while in thought until I found myself thinking that on Wednesday, I would drive in the General's Lincoln, the one with the suicide doors, down to Charlottesville. I savored in anticipation the delicious moment when I would hail Van Dillingham at the threshold of his office. It would ruin his whole day. It would be the making of mine. Later, I would have to canvass the English department to gauge the extent to which my colleague shared the chairman's opinion of me. The caboose to this train of thought was that I was going to have to meet Donna. Before I left the country, I had signed the check for the settlement our lawyers had concocted to get us free of one another. The last thing I had done before bolting was to leave a signed copy of the agreement with my lawyer, Rucker Breeden, a college roommate and one of the many whom Donna had bedded before she laid her snare for me. I turned my face to the real thing. Against the long odds of my suitability is anything more than a one night stand. I asked myself whether there was still a chance for a spent bullet like me. Well, maybe not quite spent. I brushed her cheek with my lips. Sam, I said. She stirred and rubbed her leg against my front. Baby, she said. Then she turned to face me, wrapping her arms about my neck and her legs around my hips. Later that morning, we drove to Leo McArdle's office in the Continental, whose engine ran like a sewing machine and was cleaner than most people's toasters. Sam sat right beside me, smiling, radiant, her hand touching me on the shoulder, the knee. I stopped at every light, green, red, or yellow, looking into her eyes. Idiot, she said, kissing me. Horns followed us, blaring rage, importuning us with all the tension of the mundane. I never felt such euphoria. There had been a couple of good months somewhere with Donna of sex exalted by chemicals. Maybe that was what this was too. A riot of the hormones playing the muzak of the glands. But it had been so long since I felt this good that I was beyond caring to know. I was depraved enough or amoral enough, or smart enough, just to live it. Leo McArdle, the general's lawyer and longtime crony, looked like a pirate going to seed. He lost one out of shrapnel in World War II, and he wore a black eye patch, which, which didn't fit his geriatric wardrobe of off-the-rack suits a couple of sizes too big at the shoulder, and about the same number of sizes too small at the gut. He'd always hated shaving, and yet couldn't quite give himself over to anything as heterodox as a beard. The result was a sort of salt and pepper mold that he hacked off his face every Sunday. This being Monday, his face looked like he dipped it into Cuisinart. He and the general had flown Spitfires together in the RCAF before Pearl Harbor, and they'd stayed friends. Usually, Leo left clients to junior partners like Bledsoe. It was only because he had soldiered with my father that Sam and I were admitted to his inner sanctum. Charlie was busy in court. Leo hugged Sam wholeheartedly and shook my hand with a look of bemused disapproval. His shrewd lawyer's eyes sized up Sam's radiance and determined pretty quickly if it wasn't in anticipation of the general's posthumous largesse. Well, Jack, he said, if it makes any difference to you, you're a rich man. I nodded, thinking, inherit a great fortune, inherit a great misfortune. Not much is what I said. A million and a quarter is a good-sized jingle in your pocket, Jack. I guess it won't change my life much, I said. How the hell did I know that, I thought. No, he said. The way you live, probably not. 
The general's holographic will was succinct and spare, written in his characteristically neat, slanting print script. Besides money and stock, he left me the house and cars. Sam's inheritance and Aunt Grace's death, which had come to her at 21, already had made her financially independent. But the general had left her my mother's collection of china and a half million. Your wife, Jack, made some claims against you which your father settled while you were on your travels. My ex-wife, she wasn't then. If she isn't, she will be, I said. Again, Leo threw an appraising look at Sam and then at me. There's something else, I looked at him. Melodrama and lawyers, I thought, don't mix well. Using me, actually, Charlie Bledsoe, as your agent, your father bought your land and cabin when your ex-wife put it up for sale. It comes to you free and clear. My cabin? I hadn't let myself thinking about losing the cabin in two years. Every time it would come into my mind, I'd turn it off like a light switch. The old man had known I loved it and had saved it for me. He loves you, Jack, Sam had said to me the first night I got back. Suddenly, for the first time in what felt like centuries, I thought of him as a father trying to mend fences with his son. I got up. I needed to take a bit of a walk to collect myself. Leo suggested an office down the hall. I ended up walking to the elevator and taking it down to the ground floor. The doorman, his uniform looked like a pastiche of bits left over from the Crimean War, let me out with a soldierly nod. Sorry about your father, Mr. Shock, he said. I must have looked at him oddly because he went on. I knew your father in Thailand during the war. Yes, during the war. Vietnam, he was a great man. Thanks, I went out, a great man. I'd never really seen my father as even an everyday man, let alone as a great one. As a father, I had judged him and found him wanting. All my life, he had been my adversary. He had wanted to make me tougher than the blows of fate. Now that he was gone, there was no one left to take his place, except that part of him that I had internalized. Like him, I'd never learned to live with anyone. Two years ago, a solitary drunken paladin, I'd gone sailing off melodramatically into the sunset towards Central America, masking the wounds with a cosmetically straight back, just as he had when my mother and brother and sister had died. My face, as I caught my reflection in the window, was the very image of my father's, wary, skeptical, brooding, detached. Just then, Sam walked out the door. She stood stock still, taking me in. Are you all right, Jack? Yeah. It was pretty wonderful of your dad to buy the cabin. I dropped my eyes and spoke falteringly. Never thought the old man cared enough to care for anything I cared for. He loved you, Jack. Somehow this didn't comfort me, for I wasn't sure I'd ever love him back, even now. What are you going to do, she asked. You mean about school? Well, you'll go down to school. I know that. Yeah. But what about you and me, Jack? Sam, I said. I love you. I know. My voice had gotten thick and halting, and like my old man, I hated myself for all this feeling, even as I knew that it was just this that made me what I was, made Sam love me. She came over and put her hand on my cheek. I kissed her wrist. Sam, she smiled at me. Will you marry me? Tonight? She was smiling wider. Tonight I've got covered. How about tomorrow morning? I've got that covered too. When will you drive down to Charlottesville? Classes start Thursday. She laughed. Old Doc shot, tardy as usual. That's me. Do we need to see McArdle again? No, he'll send us some papers to sign. We started walking to the Continental. What about you? I have to start teaching too. When? Friday. Why didn't you tell me? Jack, he know me in dates. Like me in dates, only worse. We were getting in the car. He know me so well. I smiled. I do, I said. We sat there a while. 
will you marry me? She looked at me. Oh, Jack, I don't know. You know. Yes, I know. She kissed me. I love you, Jack. How much? Too much. She reached out to touch my cheek. I kissed her fingers. I gotta leave for Charlottesville early in the morning, I said, as Sam already knew this. There'll be plenty of time for tomorrow. She leaned over and kissed me. It was a long, slow kiss that drained me down and pumped me up. You're a good kisser, Sam. Get me home, Dr. Shock. She winked at me. Female trouble again, I asked. Nothing you can't handle, she said. I awoke with a false dawn. Sam was asleep, her back curved into my chest. She was breathing heavily and slowly. For a while, I lay there listening to her, watching her face. I kissed her cheek. She stirred. Jackie, she said. Do you love me, Sam? I asked her again. Uh Uh-huh. I lay there a long time watching her sleep. I didn't want anything bad to happen to her. And I wondered if I was what I needed to protect her from. On the wall above her bed, there was a picture of, picture of her sitting on the backyard swing, wearing an Indian headband and holding a little bow and arrow in her hand. I couldn't really see it in the gloom, but I knew it was there. I had taken that picture of Sam with a little vivitar soon after her sixth birthday. I remembered when she had moved in with us when I was 12. She was barely four. For me, it was love at first sight. She was like a puppy, only better, with her big smile and laughing blue eyes. I'd helped Rena, the sweet old black lady who took care of us, to put her to bed, to make her lunch, and to walk her to school. I taught her to ride a bike, checked her homework. Once, when my teacher, Miss Reardon, had asked us in class to list all the people we loved, I wrote down Sam first without hesitating then Rena, and my dog Bill, and my cat Biddy. My father hadn't made the list at all. All the catastrophes, the deaths of my mother and brother and sister, of my uncle and aunt, had had the effect of deadening or at least submerging my capacity to feel much, except for Sam. I was in college when Sam began to pass through the rites of puberty, boys and bras and makeup. In college, the girls that I dated were hot bloods, They tended to be breezily promiscuous like Donna, or sexually conflicted like Sarah, another girl I had loved, and whom occasionally, because I was crazy about her, rather than because I liked it much, I sometimes shared in bed with another woman who liked women better than men, though not entirely instead of men. Both Donna and Sarah had been blondes with muddy green or hazel eyes. To me, that look was still the image of sexual desire, just as Sam with her fair skin and black hair and clear blue eyes and radiant smile was the image of that hackneyed phrase, sweetness and light. That had all changed one night when I drove up from school with Donna on a weekend when the general was on TDY out west. Sam was supposed to be staying with a friend. Donna and I were on the stairs, almost to the bedroom door, when we heard the unmistakable sounds of sex. Donna smiled at me. Sounds like little Sam is losing her cherry. She kicked off her shoes and stepped out of her panties. Fuck me on the stairs, Jack. I pushed her aside and bolted up the stairs, throwing myself against my own bedroom door. Two chiroscuro figures moved to one rhythm in the dark. I grabbed the top figure by the hair and stood him up, punching him in the gut so hard he sucked wind. Donna had turned on the light. She was laughing. Hey, Sam, is this guy any good? But it wasn't Sam. It was her friend, Gina Del Florio. She was screaming, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Donna was laughing. The guy had the dry heaves. I felt sick at the brutality of what I'd done, but I made no amends. I rushed past the door, past Donna, down the stairs to the door of Sam's bedroom. She wasn't there. Maniacally, I started pulling out her drawers, and in one of them, I found a little dial of birth control pills. Three of them were gone. I sat down on her bed, hyperventilating. Donna had followed me down. You've really got a thing for that cousin of yours, haven't you? She was walking towards me, unbuttoning her sweater. Behind her, through the open door, 
I saw the boy leaving with Gina supporting him. So let's do it here, Donna said, in Sam's room. She was putting on some of the perfume that Sam had used. Fuck me, Jack, she said. I'm Sam. I toppled her onto Sam's bed and lifted her skirt. I think I almost hated her at that moment, but I never felt so hard as when I entered her. Afterwards, I lay back next to her, staring up at the ceiling. Poor Jackie, she said. Sick and twisted, she laughed, turning towards me. She grabbed my cock. Hard again, she said. Just the way I like you.